Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on the Southeast Asia Energy Outlook 2019, which we released uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we've assembled uh, sort of the key authors of this uh, report to talk through some of the key findings and also to, to answer your questions. My name is Tim Gould. I'm a head of division and is responsible for the supply and investment work and also um, directed uh, this uh, Southeast Asia Energy Outlook. And over the next hour or so, we're going to try and do uh, three things. We're going to try and talk through some of the key analytical findings, uh, give you a sense of where, according to our analysis, uh, Southeast Asia is heading in, in an energy sense, and also where it would need to go in order to meet some key energy and sustainability goals. We're also going to talk a bit about um, the IEA engagement with ASEAN, with Southeast Asia, on some key strategic energy topics. Um, I take this opportunity to thank all of the policymakers, officials, and other stakeholders with whom we've worked as we put this uh, as we put this report together. Um, Southeast Asia is a very important partner for the International Energy Agency. Uh, we, for example, we had the honour uh, last week at our biennial ministerial meeting um, to welcome Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore, uh, and we work very closely with um, ASEAN uh, as a group uh, as well. Um, for the first 30 minutes, we're going to talk through um, some of the findings, and then we're going to leave uh, some time for discussion of those findings, and you're very welcome to submit any questions that you have um, via uh, the web browser uh, for this uh, webinar. There's a lot of information that we have um, online as well, so the report itself is available on the IEA website, um, but I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that in addition to the the outlook material and there's also three deep dives in this work uh, and you can see them on the screen uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about each of those um, and in two cases they are accompanied by additional detailed analysis which you can also download uh, from the IEA website. Uh, in addition to myself uh, you'll be hearing from uh, four colleagues from across the agency, um, Wataru Matsumura, um, who led the work on the outlooks. You'll be hearing from Maxine Jordan from our Energy Efficiency Division on the future of cooling, uh, from Randy Christensen, uh, one of our leads on electricity, on the question of regional electricity trade and integration of renewables, and then from Mike Waldron, who's the head of our investment team on uh, power sector investments. There's lots of ground to cover, but before we go on, I just wanted to say a word about, the, about how we approach long-term analysis uh, at the IEA. Um, we do have a, a view on the next five years, which you can find in our market analysis and forecasts. But when we look out beyond that, then uh, we move into the realm of scenarios. Um, those scenarios examine the consequences of different paths of action or inaction. Um, and our intention is not to in a sense, give you a, a, an IEA view on where the world will be in 2030 or 2040, um, but to think about different pathways, because uh, we want to focus attention on the choices that face decision makers uh, today. And you're going to be hearing about two scenarios that we have in the uh, World Energy Outlook. The first of those is designed to give a, a sense of where today's policy ambitions are taking the energy sector. So that includes things like the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Um, it's intended to give a sense of the way that, or the direction of travel for the energy system. And uh, one way to think through the adequacy of those policy ambitions is to compare that trajectory with one in which the goals that energy policymakers have declared for themselves are met in full. And by that, I mean uh, full implementation of the uh, of the Paris Agreement, um, the achievement of universal access to uh, modern energy, by which we mean both electricity and clean cooking, um, and also a significant reduction in the uh, pollutants that cause poor air quality. So the first of those, the direction that we're heading, uh, is called the stated policy scenario, and then, in a sense, the normative scenario, the one where we focus attention on the achievement of specific energy and sustainability goals uh, is called the sustainable development scenario. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to pass it across to Wataru uh, to talk through 
some of the broad findings of our scenario analysis uh, from, um, from this year's outlook. Okay, so let's start with the uh, energy demand. Uh, looking into 2040, with, with today's policy setting, uh, Southeast Asia would continue to see rapid energy demand growth. Uh, taking its uh, place as one of the key global uh, centers for energy. In doing so, it would add the equivalent of the current energy system of Japan to the uh, global energy demand. As might be expected, Southeast Asia looks to all fuels to meet this rapidly rising energy demand. In our projections, coal, oil, and gas meet 80% of demand growth to 2040. Uh, oil, in red, uh, continues to uh, dominate road transport demand despite an increase in consumption of biofuels. Electrification of mobility uh, with the partial exception of two, three wheelers uh, is set to make only limited inroads. Uh, gas faces competing pressures in Southeast Asia. It appears to be a good fit for the needs of the region's fast growing cities and lighter industries, but increases uh, reliance on LNG, LNG imports uh, makes the fuel uh, less price competitive. And then uh, in terms of uh, coal uh, showed in uh, brown. Uh, Southeast Asia is the only region in the world uh, where coal is projected to increase its share in the energy mix over the next 20 years. And then lastly, uh, the greens, uh, renewables uh, meet only about 20% of total energy demand uh, in 2040, uh, marginally up from 15% uh, today. And now it's the power sector. Uh, so Southeast Asia uh, is electrifying. Uh, electricity demand is set to grow rapidly in the coming two decades. Uh, growth of 4% annum uh, on average over this period is a double total energy demand growth at the same time. And then uh, this graph shows the uh, uh, annual capacity addition uh, in gigawatt term. So uh, if we see the supply side, uh, you see from the chart uh, the power generation capacity additions in the previous almost two decade period were dominated uh, by coal and gas. Although hydropower led a significant contribution from renewables, uh, wind and solar PV additions were small. And then when we look to the future in the period to 2040, and both annual capacity additions of coal and gas continue strongly. Uh, but we also see a very large uh, contribution uh, from uh, renewables at the bottom of the chart. So uh, bringing of more uh, renewables online in Southeast Asia uh, will require a clear signal uh, of a commitment by policy makers uh, to do so. And the enhancement of investment conditions to encourage uh, private sector financing. Move to the next slide. Uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, trade balance uh, of uh, fossil uh, fuel. So vertical axis is the uh, uh, unity's billion dollars. So with strong energy demand growth taking place in the context of relatively static uh, or falling upstream energy supply, energy security and energy import bills are becoming a, a serious concern for Southeast Asia and the countries in the region. Southeast Asia's considerable oil, natural gas, and coal resources have traditionally allowed the region to keep its external energy balance in check. However, Southeast Asia is on the verge of becoming a net importer of energy, and its net import bill is set to rise sharply. Uh, in 2040, the region uh, is expected to register a net deficit uh, in energy trade of over uh, 300 billion US dollar in this stated uh, policy scenario. So uh, we move on to the uh, CO2 emission. Uh, the scenario that we have discussed uh, until this point, uh, the stated policy scenario, uh, shows that Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is on track to meet some key energy policy goals, such as achieving universal electricity access. Uh, however, uh, it also highlights 
the region's current and planned uh, policies uh, fall far short of achieving other critical aims, such as uh, improving environmental uh, sustainability and reducing climate-related uh, risks, and uh, that they create additional uh, vulnerabilities uh, in terms of energy security. Uh, the transition of Southeast Asia's energy system towards the low carbon pathway based on the sustainable development scenario, uh, it is shown in uh, green, <coughs> would yield uh, manifold uh, benefits on all of these fronts. Uh, but uh, this accelerated translation would require a strong additional push from policymakers. In our view, uh, there is uh, no simple solution or a single technology, and that makes the difference. So as we see uh, multiple colors, uh, multiple approaches uh, across all sectors would be required. Different renewable technologies, including bioenergy, and a range of energy efficiency policies do much of the heavy lifting. But other technologies, including uh, CCUS, uh, for power and industry play important roles. Uh, with uh, uh, this uh, scene setting analysis in mind, uh, we uh, would like to move uh, on to the special focus area. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Wataru. As I mentioned at the start, there are these three focus areas. Wataru set up very nicely um, some of the, in a sense, the advantage, some of the positive elements of the direction in which Southeast Asia is heading, but also some of the very significant downsides in terms of energy security, but also in terms of a range of environmental indicators. Uh, and one of the key areas that we looked at in detail is uh, the future of, of cooling, um, because that's uh, a critical area for, for electricity demand and for a range of other indicators. And with that, I'd like to pass it across to uh, Maxine. Thank you. So ownership of air conditioners in Southeast Asia is growing. Um, and over the last 30 years, electricity use for cooling in the region has increased seven and a half times to almost 75 terawatt hours in 2017. This is more than South Korea's annual household electricity consumption. Yet still only 15% of households have an AC today. This is despite the fact that the need for cooling, driven by high temperatures and humidity, is already several times higher than, for example, Japan or Korea, which have almost universal access to ACs in the home. So as incomes continue to rise, it is only natural for families to start purchasing their first and even second air conditioners. This means that the trend, um, this trend will mean that the stock of ACs will increase almost eightfold to 300 million units, as we see in the graph here. Um, with Indonesia alone accounting for half this growth. By 2040, we estimate that 60% of households will have access to cooling, with households owning, on average, two air conditioners each. So what will this mean for the energy system? So while this growth is key for social and economic development, it will strain the power system. By 2040, cooling could account for 30% of peak electricity demand in ASEAN, up from about 10% today. This is equivalent to another 200 gigawatts of capacity. However, improved efficiency measures, as included in the sustainable development scenario, limit the share of cooling in peak demand to below 20%, while maintaining equivalent levels of access to thermal comfort. Therefore, reducing generation capacity needs for cooling by about half to around 100 gigawatts by 2040. Deploying more efficient air conditioners along with building efficiency improvements could contribute to 110 terawatt hours of electricity savings in the sustainable development scenario by 2040. This is nearly equivalent to the current electricity production of Malaysia, Philippines and Vietnam combined. These electricity savings would in turn result in reducing CO2 emissions by almost 30 million tons, which is equivalent to the emissions of more than 6 million cars. So how efficient do air conditioners need to become to deliver these savings, and how much better do they need to be than what is on the market today? This is what we try to answer looking at um, data from air conditioners in the region. So globally, average efficiencies will need to double. In ASEAN, that means reaching an average efficiency 
of over 6 watt per watt by 2030 and over 7.4 watt per watt by 2040 in terms of seasonal energy efficiency. These tables show the results of analysis carried out on data coming from retail surveys and national registration databases. We looked in particular at models of capacity smaller than 15,000 BTU per hour, which is the size typically used in households. Our total data sample was of several thousand models, including retail price and country of manufacture. So the boxes in green here show that models of efficiency higher than the efficiency level in that column are widely available, where widely available means that more than 60% of models met that efficiency level or higher. So those are the boxes in green. The orange color represents those of level of efficiency that was met by less than 60% of the sample, so still available, but just not as widely. And red are um, models who do not meet that level of efficiency. So the third table um, in the three tables, so availability, availability of ACs, it's showing us that in Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, more than 60% of models had efficiencies of greater than 4.3 watt per watt. And in fact, much higher, efficiencies, much higher efficiencies are available, but just not quite as widely. And in fact, these models, there are already models available in these markets that meet the efficiency levels required by the sustainable development scenario in 10 years' time, and they're already available today. So the next question would be, they may be available, but aren't they, are they not more expensive to buy? And this is where the results got really interesting, and we found that more efficient models were not necessarily more expensive than the average price of a model of that capacity. And in fact, there was little correlation between efficiency and retail price. So as an example, in Vietnam, 400 US dollars could buy you a fixed-speed air conditioner of efficiency 3.3, but it could actually also buy you an inverter model air conditioner, 70% more efficient, uh, with efficiency of 5.5 watt per watt. So looking at the second table, shown in green are the efficiency levels that are widely available and cheaper than the average cost for the same price. We also looked at the relation between where models were manufactured and their efficiency and price. And equally, we saw that there were several models available that met higher efficiency levels that were also manufactured locally and competitively priced. So we therefore see that there's potential to raise the average efficiency of models in the region by increasing that above the 3.08 watt per watt level, which is um, set to be adopted in the region from 2020. And there is potential to raise the efficiency levels in line with the sustainable development scenario. These results shown here suggest that higher standards could be implemented without necessarily penalizing local manufacture and, with, and without being more expensive to the consumer, which are common concerns faced by policymakers as they revise their math. So on the, but on the contrary, pushing up efficiency standards would bring significant life cycle energy savings to consumers alongside benefits to local industry and power system benefits that we saw earlier. This is why part of our policy recommendations include a regionally coordinated ladder for MEP to guide policymakers and increase market predictability for manufacturers. This ladder would build on the ASEAN Shine Regional Harmonization Initiative. Each country would decide its own starting level and aim to reach 6 watt per watt by 2030. So as Tim mentioned, there's a lot more detail in, um, about this analysis in the Future of Cooling in Southeast Asia report. Um, and also happy to answer any questions in our Q&A session. Thanks very much, uh, Maxine. Uh, we move on to the second focus area now, and um, Randy's going to talk us through some of the findings in relation to regional power trade and the integration uh, of renewables. Yes, so one of the things we did was we made uh, a modeling exercise focusing on uh, the value of cross-border interconnection in, re uh, in regards to integrating renewables. So we did a modeling exercise that has two uh, basic scenarios. One scenario where the share of variable renewables approaches 10%, and one uh, where the renewable share approaches 20%. Within these two scenarios, we have three cases. One where there's bilateral trade um, on the existing interconnectors. This very much uh, represents what is possible today. 
one scenario or one case where uh, there's optimized power flows across the region with a more multilateral power trade um, type type setup, but no new interconnectors. And then the last one where we still have the multilateral trade um, type setup and also expanded transmission capacity as well. It's important to note that we did not model all the countries separately in this modeling exercise. We have uh, four nodes where Indonesia, Brunei, and the Philippines have not been taken into account. This is due to lack of resources and lack of data, but may uh, come in future work. So um, the, one of the main findings of the modeling exercise you will see here, which is quite interesting, is that if you do not look holistically at cross-border trade and renewables deployment, you will actually see that cross-border trade will increase the level of emissions um, in the region. This is due to the fact that coal is quite a cheap source of generation in the region, and if no new renewables, not uh, a lot of renewables are deployed, this will then mean that coal will actually be actually be optimized throughout the region, especially if you start building new transmission um, without the added renewables, you will see this effect quite uh, rapidly. Both, uh, both scenarios, when you start going from bilateral trading to multilateral trading, will actually mean that the system cost in general in ASEAN will decrease, uh, both in terms of, of fuel costs and other variable costs. Um, we also looked into how ASEAN could potentially establish multilateral power trading. We've done a feasibility study, which is also um, available at the IEA website. This study looks into a step-by-step uh, -step approach to establishing multilateral power trading, such that uh, the ASEAN member states don't necessarily have to do it all at the same pace. And they can also do it in a voluntary uh, manner. What we found is that in order to start establishing multilateral trade, there's a set of minimum requirements that need to be met. These minimum requirements both uh, entail some policy uh, requirements, some technical requirements, and institutional requirements. The technical requirements focus mainly on harmonizing grid codes that have uh, relevance to cross-border issues. And the institutional requirements very much focus on building up some of the institutions that are already there in ASEAN um, and potentially adding new ones to handle um, more regional collaboration. After these minimum requirements have been met, ASEAN can start designing trade models where we've actually proposed three separates, um, which can be found more in detail in our study. Lastly, after the design and implementation uh, of these trade models can, can commence. Thanks very much, Randy. Um, one of the themes of the work in general, but also of our presentation today, is the importance of the power sector with rapidly rising electricity demand. And um, you know, a critical question then arises about where the money is going to come from, who's going to be doing the investing, what are some of the obstacles to that? And uh, that's a story that Mike Waldron's going to take up. Thank you very much, Tim. This uh, first chart gives you a very broad picture of energy investments in Southeast Asia. So it shows you what was invested in 2018, and then it makes a comparison between 2018 and what would be needed in the next uh, in the investment cycle over the next few decades. Um, so one of the, the striking findings we found from the report is that in general, Southeast Asia as a region has underperformed in terms of attracting uh, capital to the energy sector. As a share of GDP, Southeast Asia's in energy investment is one of the lowest among major countries and regions in the world. And over the past few years, investment in energy has actually declined in Southeast Asia, albeit much of this decline is due to a fall off in spending on oil and gas, uh, which has mirrored a global trend in spending, decline in spending in that sector commensurate with um, lower oil prices. Um, but that said, um, where Southeast Asia particularly needs growth is in the power sector, and power sector investment um, has not been growing strongly over the past few years. It's actually been leveling off. Um, so what does this chart tell us in terms of what's needed ahead? Well, um, if you compare 2018 to the two scenarios, to the stated policy scenario and the sustainable development scenario, 
you'll find that investment needs to rise no matter what pathway you're on um, to meet stronger demand growth. Um, this is particularly true in the power sector. Um, although if you're looking at the different energy pathways, depending on what pathway Southeast Asia is on, um, this has a big determination over the distribution of the investments among different energy sectors and, and sources. So for example, um, while power sector investment rises under both of the scenarios, um, fuel supply investment would need to rise under today's policy settings, um, but would need to retract somewhat under the sustainable development scenario. So you, you would need to see this reallocation of capital or shift um, more from the fuel sector going towards the power sector. And within the power sector, under a sustainable pathway, you would need to see much more investment in renewable power, um, but also in electricity networks um, to help integrate those renewables. Um, investment needs over the next two decades under today's policy scenarios are about 2.5 trillion cumulatively, um, but in a sustainable pathway, they rise um, to 3.2 trillion. And I would also note that under any pathway, you would also need increased investment and focus on the demand side and energy efficiency, um, as my colleagues have, have emphasized earlier in the presentation. Um, one thing I would note um, as a sort of bright spot is the increased investment needs under the sustainable development scenario um, are actually outweighed, or actually more than, uh, the needs are more than outweighed by the savings on net imports of fuels. Um, so essentially, putting Southeast Asia on a sustainable pathway can pay for itself in terms of the savings of, of net imports um, relative to the investment needs. So given that backdrop it, and then uh, the, the amounts of capital involved, it's worth asking the question of, of where will the financing come from? And in order to understand that, we looked at where the financing has come in the past. And here we focused on the power generation sector. Um, many of the uh, power sectors in the, in the region are set up as single buyer markets, but with participation by, by independent power producers. Um, nevertheless, where we've seen most of the sources of finance has been from public-backed capital, um, particularly from state-owned enterprises, state-owned utilities um, active in the different markets of the region. This is particularly true for coal and gas power, but also for very large-scale renewables such as hydropower and geothermal. Um, I would add that the public share of spending um, while it's mostly state-owned enterprises, it also includes the um, financing from international financial institutions, such as development finance institutions and export credit agencies, um, but these have played a relatively lower role um, than the state-owned utilities and in, in driving investment to date. When we um, look at the financing of solar PV and wind, however, we see a bit of a different picture with the financing much more dominated by private sources that have been responding to specific policy incentives. Um, overall, when we're looking at where the financing is coming from in terms of geographical markets, we found in the report that over three quarters of generation investment has come from sources within the region. So local and domestic banks, financiers, uh, sponsors, et cetera. Um, but when we're looking forward and looking at the, the amount of capital needed um, under any scenario, um, we find that public and local and regional sources alone cannot cover the sizable investment needs ahead. And so there needs to be increased focus on attracting balanced sources of private capital, um, but also from more tapping into the international markets for, for finance as well. And for this reason, we tried to address what we saw as the critical issues that were shaping Southeast Asia's power sector, its ability to attract international capital um, and then reduce risks. And we focused on four priority actions. And within the book, uh, within the report, we actually have slides supporting each of these actions in little case studies um, describing the situation. So with this chart or this table right here shows you, it's simply an overview of where we see the priority areas, but also where the particular risks are in the different markets on an indicative basis. And these priority areas are also consistent with a capacity building roadmap on clean energy and finance for the region that was adopted by ASEAN ministers in 2018. And the areas of focus are first and foremost, shoring up the enabling environment for investment through enhancing the, final, the financial performance of utilities and the power sector in general. Um, second is addressing the risks affecting the bankability of projects um, and also procurement frameworks. The third is looking more at the supply of finance 
So improving financing mechanisms, but also reducing the cost of capital, improving the the availability of of long term uh, long term debt finance, and then the last is also recognizing that it's important not just to focus on investing in the supply side, but taking investment and planning approaches that also um, recognize the importance of um, the demand side, and particularly in terms of shaping the demand for peak peak loads or peak needs, um, which can be very expensive in terms of adding new supply side investments. Um, and the ratings here simply give you an indication of where we see markets in each of these markets where we see lower risks associated with these priorities and where we see higher risks. And these are meant to just give a guide uh, for further work and for further um, policy focus ahead. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim for the conclusion. Well, thanks very much, Mike. Um, I'll mention these conclusions, but while I'm doing so, I would also invite you to submit any questions that you have um, via the browser. Um, and that will also give us a chance to, to allocate them across the, uh, the speakers who you've, who you've heard from. But essentially, our, our conclusions are all around the influential role that Southeast Asia plays. Um, but in our view, there is a, a need for different countries within the region to, to review and adapt their energy development models to um, the range of energy security and sustainability challenges uh, that we've talked about. And one of the critical ones is really this prospect of of, of rising dependence on imported fuels um, that uh, Watara talked about earlier. Um, there are policy options open to the region to mitigate that, and, and we talked about some of them, uh, and many of those options would also help um, the region to address some of the local air pollution and uh, emissions uh, hazards that, uh, that we've identified. Um, but whichever pathway we're talking about, as Mike emphasized, um, the region is going to need to attract uh, a lot more investment, uh, including, including private capital. Um, another important conclusion for the region, and I think this applies more broadly across, um, uh, across the whole world, um, is that there is no silver bullet. There's no single technology that's going to make the difference. Um, there's a host of policy measures and a host of different technologies um, that would put uh, Southeast Asia on a more uh, sustainable pathway. Um, uh, renewables play an incredibly important role in this, uh, in, in Southeast Asia's outlook, um, perhaps even more so than, than uh, you know, if you look at the difference between the two scenarios, the renewables uh, take up the largest share. Um, uh, that's a reflection of two things. Um, one, the increasing cost competitiveness of these technologies, but also reflects the fact that up until now, uh, deployment has been fairly modest uh, for, for many modern renewable technologies. And finally, um, and I hope that's come across in the uh, in the presentation today, um, there is this very rich dialogue that we have uh, at the IEA with, uh, South, with a range of actors in, uh, across Southeast Asia. Um, and that's why uh, we were very encouraged to see that the most recent uh, ministerial meeting of ASEAN Energy Ministers, um, which took place in Bangkok a couple of months ago, uh, reaffirmed that the agency is seen as a key strategic partner in helping the region tackle its energy challenges across all fuels and all technologies. Um, while the questions are coming in, there was a couple of sort of clarif clarification points that uh, I might just be able to touch up, uh, touch upon immediately. Uh, one from uh, Tarinya Supasa asked, um, in the initial slide on, on the primary energy, there was a, a category, other renewables. Um, that, I mean, the question is, what's, uh, what's included there? Um, so there were three categories that uh, were important. There's hydro, and then there was the traditional use of solid biomass, which is largely as a, uh, as a cooking fuel in the residential sector. Um, we don't consider that as a sustainable modern renewable technology. It's not necessarily a, a something that, uh, um, in a sense, should count towards uh, a, a, a vision of, of, uh, of, of moving on towards a, a more sustainable pathway. In, 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 in practice, um, our sustainable development scenario involves um, the provision of, of clean cooking uh, facilities to uh, the population at large. So that use of traditional biomass for, for cooking would, uh, would shrink under that scenario. Um, what's, clear, what's under other renewables is all of the <laughs> modern renewables, non-hydro. So that's uh, across from geothermal to wind to solar uh, and everything else. 
The, um, the other question that came in is, do we see a potential for offshore wind developments in Southeast Asia? Um, we do see some potential, um, but uh, this is not really taken up in our stated policy scenario to any degree. There is um, the wind investment that we have in that scenario uh, is, is almost exclusively onshore. Um, there's 20 gigawatts of wind in, in the stated policy scenario across Southeast Asia by 2040. Um, an indication of the potential, though, is the fact that we have um, 135 gigawatts of wind um, in the sustainable development scenario by the same date. Um, most of that is onshore. There is some potential um, um, across the region, and you can see we've, we've put together an online uh, version of a, of a sort of analysis of the technical potential for offshore wind. Um, you can see from there that there, there is a, a resource that is there to be tapped. Um, there are some indications of countries showing interest in, in, in this area. Um, uh, Vietnam, for example, has expressed interest in the World Bank's Offshore Wind Emerging Markets Fund. But um, that uh, for us is, is, a, is I mean, there, there may be easier opportunities and, and cheaper opportunities pending technology developments on the offshore um, that uh, would allow the region to expand its uh, renewable generation. So with that, uh, We've now had quite a few uh, questions uh, coming in. I would start with one on 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 cooling. Um, <clears throat> Maxine, you mentioned that the uh, southeast uh, that, that we have a sort of ladder of ambition for uh, for Southeast Asia, um, and that the ASEAN Shine program has, has is moving towards sort of harmonised standards for a range of appliances, including air conditioners. But what's your assessment of where ASEAN is on that ladder? Um, is that uh, are you considering the response thus far to be an adequate one? And uh, one other question on that from uh, Samuel Tang is about technology development. So, what do you assume in terms of technology development for air conditioners in this analysis? Sure. Thank you for this question. Um, so, the first question on the ladder, as you'll see in the um, in the report itself we have a suggestion of this ladder um, of increasing METs um, with revisions every two to three years to reach um, METs for all countries by, of six watts per watt by 2030. And we have a suggestion of three different pathways of getting there. Um, and that is based on what technology is available currently in the different countries that we've seen. Um, what technology is available, what the accessibility, affordability, and, um, and uh, the, the origin of manufacture of these different levels of efficiencies to suggest different ways of getting to this, um, uh, to, to this target by 2030. Um, so that's uh, really the approach that we, that we are suggesting, and we are continuing um, engagement with countries um, to, to, to establish um, a, a pathway forward along, along this strategy. Um, and the other question about um, technology development and uh, refrigerant that I saw was also mentioned in the question. Um, so this study focused specifically on small room air conditioners uh, because that's where we see most of the growth happening. Um, and the biggest opportunity to uh, improve the average efficiency of these models by um, strengthening the maps. So we see that really as a, as a strong priority for the region uh, from an energy perspective. So that's why this part of the, foc of the study focused um, on inverter, non-inverter um, model room air conditioners. We, are, uh, we have also been collecting refrigerant information, and that is going into our Kigali tracker, which is um, the, to track progress of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, um, and that's with the, um, the, the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, um, which is also on our website, and there'll be um, a further analysis coming out of that. Thanks very much, Maxine. Um, there's a question here from um, Sean Wang on the uh, electricity trade uh, analysis. The question is, what's the key benefit of trading amongst ASEAN countries? Um, how much money can be saved by encouraging trading and why? Um, thank you very much for that question. We have a number of key benefits for enabling um, 
trading between the countries. One of the first is actually what you mentioned, um, the, uh, the economic benefits. So one of our estimates say that we can uh, reduce system costs by um, something like five euros per megawatt hour uh, with the expanded uh, trade scenario. <clears throat> another, another very key benefit is system uh, operations um, that when you integrate large shares of renewables, it's very important to expand your, for example, balancing areas so that you can share the, um, the, the variability in the system, which makes it easier to integrate the renewables. Uh, you also obviously have the environmental impact since that um, the multilateral trading will enable higher shares of renewable integration. And lastly, not, but not least, you have uh, security of supply. That's a, that's a benefit. You will have um, some saying that when you start to integrate, you can have um, shocks from other, other systems affecting your uh, electricity system, which is true. But from our perspective, the benefits of, um, of uh, the, the integration is a lot higher than um, the potential risks. And uh, in general, uh, we assess that around $1 billion uh, in operational costs can be saved with multilateral trading. Thanks very much, Randy. Um, a couple of questions on, on, on Vietnam, and I'd like to bring in one of the elements of the uh, analysis that, at least for us, was, was stimulated some thinking, which is that um, if you look at the, 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 the gigawatts of new coal-fired capacity that have been approved for development over time. Um, you've seen quite a significant slowdown uh, since 2014. And at the same time, you've had something of a pickup in the um, investment in uh, new wind and solar PV, um, such that in the first half of 2019, um, the amount of new solar that was brought online um, actually exceeded for the first time um, the capacity of new coal that was approved. And to some that looked like a, an inflection point, I mean, we shall see, of course, whether that's, uh, whether that's the case. Um, but one of the interesting um, issues was that the vast majority of that new wind and solar uh, was attributable to one country, uh, which was Vietnam. Um, and I'd like to ask Mike to comment on in a set, the reasons for that boom of uh, investment in Vietnam, and if indeed it is a boom, um, is there a risk that uh, it's followed by then a, a, a slump? Mm. Yeah, um, so, so Vietnam is a, is, has been a quite dynamic market um, in terms of particular solar PV, but also um, to some extent wind as well. Um, I mean, it's a country with, with very good resources in, in Southeast Asia, and the investment that we've seen um, over the past year, year and a half, um, has been linked to strong policy incentives in terms of the feed-in tariff uh, offered by the government, but also this change in incentives, which was signaled for the, uh, for the midpoint of the year, which drove up a lot of activity and, and development of projects. Um, that said, um, the nature of the investment um, raises some questions over uh, how strong it's going to be going forward and, and also related to some of the risks in the investment environment there. Um, a lot of the financing was done by local and regional players. Um, a lot of it was heavily weighted towards uh, equity financing, so not a huge amount of involvement by banks, particularly international banks, um, which has kept, rel kept relatively high the, the cost of capital, or at least as we can assess um, the cost of capital for projects. Um, there's questions over the bankability of the PPAs um, still in Vietnam, uh, despite some, some changes and in, in reforms from the government side. Um, and at the same time, the, the, sore, the sheer pace and the, um, the concentration of development in a few provinces um, raises questions over the ability of EVN to, to integrate um, all of this new solar PV capacity in a, um, in a smooth way um, over time. So it raises uh, risks related to curtailment of, of renewables. Um, so despite the fact that there's, there's been some attractive um, economics in Vietnam, there's still some more fundamental questions uh, related to the bankability of the projects. Um, which raises a question for us for investment. Um, there was also a question asking about um, direct PPAs in Vietnam. So um, direct PPAs being also corporate PPAs, 
Um, this is something that we looked at in Southeast Asia as well. And there are, um, there's been some development of the corporate PPA market, but, but not a huge amount. Um, and in general, we, we concluded that scaling up corporate sourcing around the region uh, requires more progress and regulations allowing for third party grid access, uh, the contracting and reselling of power, utility reforms, and also certification to ensure that the, um, the corporate procurement ideally actually leads to additional capacity being developed. So. There's a, a follow-up question um, in relation to Indonesia. Um, say, um, send it from um, Arjun that's asking that uh, about new investments in solar in Indonesia have stalled as a result of um, policy regulatory environment. Some of the changes that you, some of the issues that you've been talking about, unfavorable tariffs, local content requirements, onerous land acquisition requirements, and, and that's affected the financial viability of, of projects. Um, could you comment on that, uh, some of the particular issues in relation to um, investment in um, renewable technologies in Indonesia, and do you see any changes in the investment environment? Yeah, I mean, all, all of those factors are, are quite present in, in Indonesia, and they're, they're all a mixture of factors um, due to, to different drivers within, within the government, but also related to the, to the state-owned utility itself. Um, one of the key things that we looked at in Indonesia is we did a bit of a case study looking at PLN and what types of actions would be needed to improve PLN's financial position um, because it is the financial position and the financial viability of PLN, which also um, has big reverberations in terms of the, the willingness of the state-owned utility to pay um, tariffs which are attractive enough to spur renewable development. Um, we've seen renewable costs come down in many parts of the world, um, but the um, development in Indonesia hasn't been kick-started to the point um, where we've seen those kind of economies of scale. Um, and so as a result, renewables in Indonesia still need relatively higher uh, levels of incentives. But, but broadly, what we looked at with regards to, to PLN um, was looking at how combinations of retail tariff reforms, um, but also better utilization of existing capacity rather than adding new IPP capacity to the system, um, much of which has uh, very sort of onerous take or pay contracts associated with it. And here I'm talking about the thermal capacity um, could improve um, the financial position of the utility and also reduce the amount of subsidy necessary from the government. And, and this is a key factor to um, addressing a lot of those issues mentioned, although it doesn't address um, all of them. We've got time for um, uh, a few more questions. Uh, there's one follow up for uh, Randy in relation to uh, the description that she gave of the benefits of regional electricity trade. So, uh, if the benefits are there and they're clear, then you know why isn't it happening? What are the challenges that uh, that prevent some of these uh, projects, some of these trading initiatives from going ahead? Thank you very much for that question. Um, there are some challenges when you when you start to think about multilateral trading. Um, I would divide them into several categories, the first of what, which being political. Um, when you start to do multilateral trading, depending on the model, you may be more uh, reliant on your neighbors for security of supply, and this can be politically challenging. Um, from a technical perspective, you also have uh, quite a lot of development that you need. For example, you need the harmonization of, of technical standards, you need data sharing agreements, uh, and you need, quite simply, infrastructure. Um, when we talk data and infrastructure, infrastructure can take quite a long time to develop and there's also a balance between prioritizing international infrastructure development versus your internal uh, grid development. On data sharing, um, data on electricity systems can be quite sensitive in nature, so uh, that takes a lot of uh, agreement on classification and that type of stuff. Lastly, I would say there's also institutional um, challenges. When you do multilateral trading, some institutions are required, and actually one of very kind of practical issues that often pop up in all types of regions is where to place these institutions. Um, so this takes uh, preparation and agreement, uh, and it's, it's also important to have a strong political drive to make this succeed, and actually also a um, strong dispute resolution mechanism. Um, not in the sense that when trading happens, the dispute resolution, but more in the sense that when discussions get stuck over the different technical and institutional aspects, that you have somebody to actually drive the, the conversation forward. I think ASEAN is, is 
well placed to start this, uh, but it does require some, some development going forward. Um, and depending on the type of models that ASEAN will go forward with, there may be potential for actually starting the development in sub-regions of ASEAN. Thanks very much, uh, Randy. There's a question on the coming, uh, coming through uh, Maxine might wish to take up um, about how we project the rate at which more efficient air conditioners are, are adopted or taken up by households. Um, is it related to income? Is it related to temperature change? So what are the drivers for that? Um, and also, why does Indonesia seem to play a very significant role uh, in the increase in energy for cooling? Um, is that just based on numbers of household population or so, or is there some other um, element in play? Yeah, so the, the stock of air conditioners um, as, we, as we model them um, is related to of course, weather and cooling degree days, but in, in Afghan in particular, of course, um, uh, income, because there's um, no question that with high temperatures, um, uh, as, as people can afford to buy an air conditioner, they will um, tend to do so. Therefore, with the high population and incomes rising, that is why we see um, an increase in the, in the stock um, and ownership of air conditioners per household. Um, and the, regarding um, the role, the, the huge portion of this growth in Indonesia that um, is due, exactly due to the fact of, due to these effects with the huge population and number of households, um, as ownership increases, um, that means a huge number um, of increased, um, of, of air conditioners being added. Thanks very much, Maxine. So there's, um, uh, I think, a final question, um, but a quite a broad one, on you know the outlook for coal, um, the outlook for gas. Whether we can say something in general about that, and that us, we're tired to take the uh, the coal point, and I'll I'll uh, I'll say something on gas. Uh, so uh, about the uh, coal. Uh, so as we see uh, the pre uh, the uh, slides. Uh, uh, Power uh, uh, generation market of ASEAN uh, will expand uh, in coming two decades. And then uh, in our chart, uh, we, under the current policy settings, the uh, coal market, coal power generation market also expands, uh, driven by the uh, strong uh, electricity uh, demand growth. Uh, but the, there are, we are seeing rising concern about the CO2 emission and then, uh, uh, air pollutants. So it will be the uh, a challenge for the uh, coal sector uh, <clears throat> to compatible with such <clears throat> climate goals, and so there will be uh, additional investment to the uh, CCUS or uh, environmental equipment uh, to cut SOX and NOx, and, and so that uh, factors into place for the uh, coal uh, uh, provision. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Um I think on, on natural gas, um, there's a couple of uh, elements that I think are important to highlight. Um, the first is that, I mean, traditionally, a lot of the gas that's been used across the region has come from within the region. Um, but as you saw in the, the net import slide, um, you know, the, a region that's traditionally been a provider of LNG to the rest of the world is increasingly going to be looking to bring that LNG or bring that gas in from somewhere else. And that naturally has a, an impact on the, on the price at which that gas is available. So, Gas faces some really quite significant competitive challenges in many markets um, uh, faced with the coal that uh, Watara was talking about, but also faced with increasingly um, cost competitive uh, renewables. And so one noticeable thing that you, could, uh, you can see in our projections in the stated policy scenario is whereas over the last 20 years, the main source of growth in gas demand has been the power sector, um, that's no longer true uh, over the period of 2040. You actually get more of the increase in gas demand uh, comes from industrial uses. Um, and how that, you know, how gas fits into the ASEAN energy mix is again quite contingent uh, on, on policies. So to what extent is it going to be seen as a, a solution to some of the issues faced, particularly by um, the region's large and expanding sort of urban urban centres, 
uh, where if you take China as an example at the moment, it is being seen as part of the solution there for, um, for industrial use, um, again, more so than for power generation. But that has required in China a policy push to bring gas into the mix, to build up the infrastructure. Um, it, it remains to be seen how strong uh, that policy push uh, is going to be uh, across uh, across Southeast Asia. So there's a number of, of question marks there over the um, over the balance of, uh, of demand for both um, both of those fuels. Um, and then the critical determinant of the which which way things go, um, you know, at least in our scenarios, but I think also in practice is, is the way in which um, those fuels fit into the policy vision that uh, is articulated by um, by the by the region and the region's policymakers. Um, so with that, we've uh, we've reached the end of our hour. So um, I, it remains only for me to thank very much uh, our speakers today, who all contributed to um, to the outlook that's available online. And as as was mentioned, there's an awful lot more information that is available on the IA website. And so there's an open invitation to explore that. Um, if you do have questions, there are also um, email addresses included where you can reach us. And there are a, a, a couple of questions that we didn't have time to get to. Some of them are just questions of detail, which we can easily respond to um, uh, by email. I think we have your contact details as part of the registration process, so we'll follow up uh, with you directly. So many thanks to you all for, uh, for joining us for this webinar today. And we hope to um, have the chance to interact with you again uh, in future uh, with more IEA analysis on, on this region or on other parts of the world. Thanks very much indeed.